Hey everybody, this is Feng Zhu speaking and welcome to this week's Design Cinema. So sorry for the long delay, but we are back and let's just jump right into this uh, week's episode. So the focus this uh, for this these three paintings, we're going to see three of them this week, is to kind of paint with a traditional focus to emulate what we we'll have done if this was painted on canvas. And you can see me here starting with a very rough brush and color picking uh, our palette. Now this is partially photo ref and partially made up and I'll talk about that as we get into the painting um, because this is a very good practice we actually assign this to some of our students as well um, but there's a lot more to it than just looking at a photograph and painting it because to really grasp the um, the core of these paintings you have to understand what you are painting because you could paint anything if you good it out and uh, spend say a six month painting every single corner you can actually do entire painting without ever knowing the subject matter uh, do you know what I'm saying like you imagine I covered the entire painting with a tiny grid and every Every day I reveal to you a tiny portion of that grid and you just paint that. Uh, by the end of the month you could probably have the painting done or even you know end of the week you have a painting done without ever knowing what you painted. And that's in that sense you're only practicing technical skill, training your eyeball to see stuff. But are you really understanding? And for us in the industrial design side, our students must not only to uh, paint and draw well, they also have to understand the science behind what they are painting. So. I use this example and these three paintings as an example to show you guys uh, what their focus will be. Now to emulate traditional painting, I'm doing all these on one single layer, so there's no ever a new layer added. And I'm trying to stick to a single brush, in this case this is the uh, chalk brush which you guys have seen me use many many times. Um, for this painting, however, I did cheat slightly because to, to paint all the branches in the tree was taking way too long. Uh, on a video, I thought it would run too long, so I actually used a custom brush to do that. But everything else is painted with a single brush, single layer. Uh, and when I get to that, I'll show you guys what I mean. So the the setup is quite simple. I basically have two screens. On my laptop screen, I have the uh, sort of a photo ref of this scene. Now, what I'm painting here is not exactly the same, uh, but it's close. It's uh, partially is made up, and I'll explain why 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 we do that. Uh, but anyways, and then on the main screen is my Photoshop. So what I do is kind of take a look at the screen and then color match and color mix, which you saw in the beginning, to get the major colors down and the major values. And then once we have that, then we can sample from within the painting. Um, you see that the color picker sometimes uh, comes up on the screen, especially in the beginning parts of this video. Now, once all that stuff is set, then you can use something called the H, uh, the hue and saturation slider uh, to then tone your colors. For example, you want a darker green, you want a lighter green. You could then adjust that very easily with a little slider. Oh, by the way, here's the tree brush that I'm using to do the branches, you see? To so paint all those branches, it just take too long. So I just save a little bit of time. But that's the only time I would uh, use a custom brush. Everything else is uh, the chalk brush. Uh, anyways, go back to the color picker. So Photoshop by default gives you the RGB slider. So if you open your swatch in the color palette, you'll see that it, it has an RGB. Now just use a little option thing and change it over to the hue saturation one. It's much easier to use the, because the RGB is just a bunch of colors. The hue saturation allows you to pick a green and then pick the saturated version of the green, a darker value of the green. So it's very, very easy to slide that stuff around. And that's how I get the colors once the major ones are done. Because for example, like this tree, I want it to be a slightly saturated version of this kind of aqua greenish color tone. I'll just slide that over on the slider and it's very easy to do. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, why we paint these, you know, what, what's the core practice here, right? Just to copy a photograph, I don't think you learn too much doing that. Now it is good, anytime you're doing drawings is good, uh, but I also think that you have to add understanding on top of that. So what we teach students here is like, for example, let's look at the mountains in the background. It has that kind of a bluish hue to it. Why is it occurring? And that's because of atmosphere, it's because of light, how that reacts, the time it reaches your eye, a lot of the darker value is gonna get diluted. And also by tra the light traveling through the air, you're gonna get all sorts of, uh, mostly a bluish hue from just the environment itself, right? the oxygen, the nitrogen, all those kind of uh, different things in the, in the air, which tend to give a bluish hue. So, no, so th things like that, for example, the tree is very dark. Now we know that a tree, uh, if you look at it close up, it's not a blackish kind of dark green color like that. It's going to be brown. But in, cause it, in a situation like this, because we're kind of backlit, uh, the values are going to be much darker, right? The light balance is different uh, in this case. So the tree is going to be silhouetted against a light environment and therefore making it dark. So those are all the things that you want to pay attention to while painting to not only just capture, but to understand. Uh, for example, underneath the tree, there's a couple of boxes, and those boxes have this little highlight on top. Now, why does that occur? Why is that highlight 
bright. You know, the sun is not hitting that. The light is not hitting that. Right? That's not because of the primary light source. But that's a result of material and reflections, right? The angle in which it's uh, facing the camera is going to result in that uh, highlight, which is actually a reflection being bounced off the top of that surface because it's parallel to the eye. So those are kind of the fundamental stuff that there's a lot of that stuff taking place in this painting on the road itself as well. So as the students paint, we try to explain those kind of little things out uh, so they gain a lot more. Okay, we generally don't assign too much of this kind of uh, stuff in our school because uh, to me, this stuff is not the most challenging stuff to do. It's much better to actually do one of these paintings and then make one up, which we'll do in this video. The first two are going to be, I say about 70% photo raft, and the last one's completely made up. And you guys will see that the approach to it actually is a little bit different as well. Um, so the reason why I say these are partially made up is because I'm doing these in widescreen. The original photo ref of these, which I took, right? They're not from Google. They're not from anywhere. They're, they're my own photos. So that way you stay very clear of copyright. So they're my own photos, but they're taken with a, with a 4.3 camera. The ratio system is like a square, right? So, but here I wanted to paint it more like a film ratio. This is a two, three, five uh, film ratio. So, in order to do that, I have to rebalance the composition, right? The square composition versus a, a flat screen or this kind of uh, wide screen, sorry. Composition is very different. So, what I have to do is I kind of shift stuff around, move, make stuff certain uh, a little bit bigger, like this tree is a little bit bigger, and it reaches across the screen past the center point a little further. All that kind of stuff to balance. Uh, same thing with the fence on the left side. In the original, there is no fence. There's kind of like a two sticks sticking out of the grass or something. So I extended that out to give us a composition. And same thing with the flow of the grass. I made the grass kind of flow uh, up away from the road. You can see on the right, it kind of goes from the left to right, right, the wind direction. And the on the other side, it goes the other way. Uh, all that is kind of rebalanced to match composition, in which the real one doesn't do that. The real one, all the grass is just going straight up. Um, but I thought that kind of boring for composition. So anyway, so that's what I'm talking about where um, some of the stuff is made up and the tree, all the branches and all the directions are made up too. You know, I'm, I'm, the, my goal here is not to copy a photo one for one. Uh, like I said, that's the grid system. If you copy a photo one to one, yeah, you gain some technical skill out of it. But you know, what I'm trying to learn here is to paint and learn the environment, learn the science. And if I change the direction of a branch, you no, know, that doesn't really destroy the painting. Right. So, uh, so at this painting is almost done. So in real time, these took about an hour and a half for the first one and as well as the second one. And the third one was much faster. That one's only one hour long. It's because we're making it completely up. We don't have to really reference to anything and just paint uh, what we want. And generally that goes much faster. So here I'm just adding some atmosphere to try to complete this painting. So uh, when the second painting shows up, we'll start talking about the technical stuff that goes behind these paintings and the decisions we make, right? So this one's almost done. So let's wait for this to wrap up and we'll start the second one. Uh, but we can jump into to, uh, that already. You see that when this painting started, I used a very crazy looking brush. Okay, this is good. So first let's get the background values, right? I generally start with a kind of a 50% value. So you can see mixing all the colors here. And this is the brush I'm talking about, this crystal brush I use, right? which is really bizarre. I used it in the other paintings as well. The reason why I use that, again, is to prevent straight lines. I don't want edges. My goal here is not to make this kind of super tight, super photo real, every single detail captured in a painting. Actually, the goal is the exact opposite, is can we paint only light and only major forms and without ever painting a detail and get this painting to read. And to do so, I want to avoid hard lines. You know, in reality, there's really no hard lines separating uh, of one shape on top of another. It's only value that's separating those things together. So what I'm trying to do here is paint a major values, to all the stuff that's going to define the forms without ever have to do, you know, draw every single wood grain, make the font all perfect. You know, I'm purposely trying to mess that stuff up so my eye don't get caught up too much in, in trying to capture that and waste a lot of time. Right, so for this painting, you could blur your eye. You can see that it start, all the local values are starting to work already. The light is starting to work. But it's very rough when you unblur your eye. And that's when, it, when we, I switch over to the chalk brush and then clean that stuff up. Yeah. So the initial, I say the initial, for me, the initial five to 10 minutes of a painting is very critical because that's when I define all the, uh, all the major stuff that I'll need, the, the colors, the lighting, the mood, right? Once we have that, then we could just paint locally. I could sele color select and just hue and tone those colors around and just paint, 
Yeah. So this scene here, the, the first one was a kind of very um, still life type of scene, just grass. This one, I want to do something a little bit more challenging, a little bit more zoomed in, and we have some man-made vehicles. So this is a uh, in Vietnam. So also the composition's been tweaked. I moved the boats around. I also stretched their designs out a little bit. The original, they're, they're much shorter than this, these boats that um, kind of go on the rivers. So I just altered the design. Uh, I don't think that's going to hurt the painting at all. Uh, again, to match composition. I also added some stuff on the left and the right. There's n doesn't exist on the photo at all. So those beams, those mountains and stuff are not there. So I just have to add those kind of stuff in to rebalance. Um, uh, because this boat has some stuff in the foreground, I tend to focus on the background first. So that's much easier to clean up later. Uh, if, you, if For example, if I draw some beams and handrails in the foreground, it's going to be very hard to then paint the sky behind that, right? Because I have no layers, keep in mind. There's no layers here, so I cannot just do the rails on one layer and then turn those off to do the background, right? So there's all kind of uh, the traditional type of thinking. Now we do the same thing back in the in the gouache days, uh, which you start with light colors, start with the background, and then kind of build your way up into the details and the final uh, cleanup. Right. So here, just working my way in. This painting is a little bit more challenging than the last one because um, this one has perspective involved. These boats, you cannot just kind of randomly draw it, otherwise they will not feel man-made. You know, when you have perspective issues in, in things that are, that are uh, structural, you're going to have some wobbly looking um, paintings, right? But looseness is, is very tricky to capture in here. See like the boat, for example, this boat, I put a yellow stripe on it. Now I, I purposely try to break that yellow stripe in the, in the way the brush mark works to try to work with the brush. Right, so and you can see that going throughout the painting as well, of the brush pattern matching the flow of the shapes, and that's going to just help uh, sell the contour of your forms. Okay, so I I study industrial design, so the I actually never really studied too much traditional painting. The, we did do a lot of traditional painting in terms of gouache and stuff like that in school, but we did it from the industrial design way. You know, if you guys are familiar with Sid Mead and the uh, John Berkey and these type of guys, we learned that style of painting and that kind of approach. So when I'm doing the kind of these traditional paintings, I'm actually just sort of doing it on my own. I'm kind of making it up. Now, is it right? Is it wrong? I don't know. Do you know what I'm saying? There's a million ways or infinite ways of doing a painting. So the way you want to judge all this kind of stuff by is just do your own. You know, there, there's no one way to follow my way. It's just one of infinite ways of doing this kind of stuff. So, and also as you're learning, just compare all the work to yourself. You know, don't don't judge your stuff by compared to other people out there. We're trying to emulate somebody else. Uh, just paint it your way. There is no wrong way to do it. The only thing that matters is the end result. You know, what we tell our students here is like, as long as you're not tracing somebody's work, as long as you're not plagiarizing somebody's work, then whatever process you're using, really the clients at the end of the day do not care. Do you know what I'm saying? Now, if I photocopied this or got it from the net and called it my own, yeah, that's that's not right, right? That's that's not legal, anyways. Um, but if you want to start with super detail on the left corner and paint your way all the way to the bottom right corner, and every single part of the painting is detailed as you go, that's fine. You know, no one can say that's wrong. So work the way that you're comfortable. For me, I always do the big, big, bigger picture first. That's just a production type of thinking. You know, within the first five, 10 minutes, I got the painting sort of already blocked in. So at that stage, you can always kill the painting if it's not going the right direction. All right. So detail to me is the last thing. All right. So, and a painting really is, is you're, you're painting light. You're not painting uh, line work at all. You're not drawing anything. So certain forms will blend together. Certain things will merge together. Certain values will be similar. All those kind of things you have to um, think a little bit different than doing a line drawing. Right? Not everything has to be defined. And, uh, and particularly for these paintings in which I want to capture a almost an oil painting kind of uh, feeling on, on the canvas. And notice I rarely zoom in or zoom out. Uh, when I do my own paintings, I do that a lot to check my values, to check all these various things. But here, I'm trying to get close as possible to painting these traditionally. So it's almost like having a canvas is my screen, and on the canvas, you can't zoom in or zoom out. So you just sit at the same distance and just paint, you know, one layer, one brush, and just, just get it done. Okay. Now let's see what else we can talk about here. Um, so the learning thing here is quite important as well. Let's talk about some of the interesting stuff that we could absorb, uh, observe in this painting. For example, the water. Notice the uh, reflection level goes up as it goes further away from us, away from the eye. And that's the same thing has to do with those boxes from the previous painting. The surface at that angle is starting to become um, parallel to the eye. Therefore, the material is starting to reflect. The same thing is happening on the top of this blue boat. Uh, you can see this top surface there becoming quite shiny and start reflecting the rails in. That's all material. That, that really has nothing to do with light. It's just how the, the uh, reflection of materials work as it gets 
more parallel to the eye. Same with the top surface of the boat, the, the yellow one that I'm painting right now, and the rooftops. Those are, uh, of course, it has to do with light because you, without light, you can't see anything. But the reason why it's doing that is because of materials, right? We have gloss, we have semi gloss, and we have uh, reflective, you know, 100% and matte and ma uh, matte material, three main types. And judging by what the material is, is it wood, is it you know, metal? It's going to have different effects on the way it reflects uh, at the certain angles to the camera or to the eye. So those are all the kind of things we pay attention to. And of course, this is a very clean area. This is Vietnam here. The air is very clean. So the haze most likely is going to be in the blue hues. Right? You're not going to get the grays, uh, in which you get, get somewhere like in Los Angeles or um, somewhere that's polluted like Beijing, right? in which there's more pollution in the air than, than, the, uh, than the clean stuff, the air itself. Right? So here, obviously, the, the air is going to be quite clean. So we get the blue haze. Um, okay, uh, let's keep talking about technical wise. These are painted about at 4,000 pixels wide. So not super high, uh, but high enough that the brush doesn't get pixelated. Yeah. So I don't want to paint these super high because I'm not zooming in. These are all just treated uh, traditionally again. Right. So 4,000, 5,000, around that range is, is pretty good. Okay. So both of these right now are still photo ref. When we get to the third one, you'll see that the approach is very, very different from than these two uh, because we have to make it up from scratch. Okay, so these ones are still relatively easy. In my books, these these are not super hard to do. You have something pretty much like 70%, you know, in front of you telling you what to paint. Um, another way to practice this is actually do it in real life. Take your laptop out, or just go out somewhere. Uh, you have to build yourself a little sun shield just in case the you know the reflection thing on the screen, and then just paint these from real life. It's pretty much the same kind of thing, but real life is a little bit harder because one, things are moving around sometimes, so you cannot get stuff to sit still uh, like a scene like this the boat will be gone within like two you know a minute or so it'll be gone off your site so you have to uh, make some stuff up as you go and also the uh, color picking is a little bit trickier uh, here what I could do is like a color pick and put the color as you guys saw maybe a few times where I put it right up to the painting and I'm balancing that according to the painting so it's easier a little bit easier to see uh, you could do the same thing in real life but just a little bit more um, time consuming right and that's why this stuff takes a lot fat is much faster to do this in digital than, than uh, traditional painting Right. Or maybe get an iPad or something like that and go sketch out in the in the in real world, right? So any kind of painting is good. You know, it doesn't matter how you do it. You know, what what method you use, it's always good to just draw. You know, get your brain and your hand eye coordination going there. Okay. So at this point, I'm just cleaning stuff up, uh, matching the flow, the direction. So look look at the front of the boat, how the direction of the brush follows that of the. Um, the forms. Okay, we're on our third painting here. So this is going to be a different approach. This is all completely made up painting, but using what we learned from the first two to achieve this one. But I'm going to use a pre-existing photo that I took in Kyoto. This is just some random castle. I'm going to use that as my, my, my canvas. I'm going to scratch my surface up and use all the local values found within this photo right here to do the rest of my painting. So I select the rooftop, for example, which gave me this kind of brownish color, and then I just hue and tweak that color to get it to a lighter brown. Now, there is a photo ref being used here. It's a photo ref I took in, uh, I forgot what this, it's called some kind of temple, not that far from Tokyo, um, which has this giant uh, paper lantern kind of thing hanging in the middle. Um, but that photo has different perspective, different view, different lighting, whatever. I'm using it purely as a structural reference, uh, but the camera angle and everything else, and lighting is, uh, is made up from scratch. But because we just did two other paintings that's more of a photo real approach, um, we try to do this one and match some of the similar effects. Okay, but I start to use the same. The only thing here is I cannot color, I have nothing to match. There is no photo reel for me to kind of color pick and uh, you know try to bring up the color picker and try to match the colors by eye. We don't have anything. So the only what I do here is we start with some of these photo plates to extract the values, and then start then go back to the uh, crystal brush to rough everything up. You know, so the starting point is exactly the same. Okay, just the color selection you have to do it by eyeball. There is no uh, there's no support in terms of that. Um, so the structure, this is a very architectural heavy uh, drawing here, but as a painting, I don't want to get too tight either. I don't want to go in there and mark everything perfectly, you know, and spend like two hours doing a super tight line drawing, uh, because the, the finished look I want here is still a quickly painted uh, uh, sketch painting. You know, I'm not going for a photo type painting here. Um, if I'm going for that, then I'll probably spend some time drawing a very nice line drawing. Now, it all depends on the finish level you're looking for. So these are these are just meant to be rough. So this one only took one hour to paint, very, fairly fast. Okay, and also at 4,000, all these are done at the same resolution. So uh, let's see what else we can talk about here. So the focal point here, when I started this painting, I actually 
really didn't know where I was going with it. Uh, like just like the previous, um, not the from this tube, but the previous, for example, the Tannhauser gate painting. Uh, I like to find my way into the painting sometimes, especially for these quick ones. I find that my results are better if I'm not uh, planning these too far ahead. In fact, most demos I do for our students, they're all not planned uh, subject matter wise, right? I know what I'm going to teach them in terms of what uh, the painting is going to achieve. You know, are we teaching values? Are we teaching color? Are we teaching composition? Those things are there, but the subject matter, I don't plan them uh, because I think in a way spontaneous and also instinct is quite important in our line of work. Uh, even when I'm painting these, I cannot work in absolute science, uh, silence. I have to have music, I have to have something, noise, people talking because when I'm concentrating too much, that actually goes against uh, my workflow. I, I feel like I'm concentrating just a little bit too into it and you start tightening up super quick. You start, oh, let's paint this beam and let's make it perfect. And you spend all that time doing something that's not uh, necessary versus if I'm kind of my brain is sort of half concentrating, half kind of thinking about something else, the instinct side starts to paint and that works really fast. You get the painting done really quick and you have the spontaneous uh, feeling in your painting that it, it has life to it. Right? So that's just my personal thing. I also know people that needs to work in absolute silence. So it's personal choice. For me, the, 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 the noise level has to be at a certain level for me to be pretty comfortable. So for me, I actually enjoy uh, doing demos while uh, talking to my students, and, you know, just blabbering about random subject matters or talking about this and that and, and paint because that keeps my brain sort of semi-occupied on something else. And the painting is actually just taking place on its own, you know. So I think some of you guys maybe could relate to what I'm saying, you know, too much concentration sometimes is not the best, you know. So depending on what you're doing, of course, you're doing like perspective homework. I think that's quite important. So, you know, a good way to look at it is like, I think a lot of you guys probably draw in your sketchbooks, right? And you always notice that your sketchbooks look better, you know, when you sketch something versus then, okay, let's do this as a final drawing. Your final drawing then doesn't look as good. It's because you're focusing probably too much. You're, you're trying too hard to make make it a nice drawing versus when you're doing a sketch, your your brain is relaxed. It's going, look, this is not my final. This is just, just a whatever. It's a throwaway painting or a throwaway sketch, but you end up doing something that's actually better and it looks more lively. So as a uh, for what we do in a professional field, we always want to try to capture the final drawing but always treat it as if it's a throwaway sketch. And that's usually gives us the best results. And that's what I'm doing uh, in all these paintings, you know, to semi not concentrating, basically. Um, it sounds kind of weird, but that's really how I work. I just can't, you know, if the room is super silent, there's no way I could work. You know, it's just way too much concentration, too much energy, too much tension. You know, you want to break all that stuff up. So this painting here is almost done. This is the roughest of all three of them, right? Uh, still, but, you know, uh, try to capture that kind of um, super quick brush on canvas look. Right, purposely keeping the brush strokes on the page and not getting rid of them. You know, purposely making some stuff not refined. Like the corners of this painting are super loose. They're not even defined at all. You know, and that's not just on purpose to get that get that look. And uh, also lighting for this one is very different than the previous two. The previous two has a photo lighting to them. This one is a thema uh, thematic or entertainment type lighting, you know, stage lighting. So done for, for example, for a cinematic, for a video game or, or a film or something, where this is done by a lighting person versus letting the sun do all the lighting. Do you know what I'm saying? So this is staged to show off the big lantern and the dude, the samurai guy in the middle, right? We're lighting this on purpose and we're dimming the four corners down and I'm adding little kind of candle lights into the dark background back there so this has the uh, all the elements we need to make a cool shot yeah to, to tell a story yeah whereas the previous two are kind of like still life they're, they're just, just they're just capturing some kind of subject matter but they're not really trying to tell anything um, this painting is, is lit uh, different yeah in that sense so Anyways, wow, this episode flew right by. Um, I hope I covered enough subject matter for you guys, and also just to uh, just so you guys can see it, uh, you know what what goes into one of these kind of looser paintings. Um, uh, you know, practice the kind of stuff, and the best way to practice just use one brush, one layer. You know, actually no layers. These are painted on the background basically, and just paint stuff. You know, anytime you're doing something, it's good. And I think next week we're gonna go back and do some character stuff. It's been a while since I painted some character stuff, so I wanna get back and get to that. So as you guys see some of these zoom ins and slow pans, uh, hope you guys enjoyed this episode, and uh, I will see you guys uh, next week. All right, thanks for watching, and bye bye.